Did you really think we were going to get through an entire offseason without any assistant coaches leaving for another job? Well, that happened on Monday late morning when Cody Burns accepted a job with the New Orleans Saints. What's to come for that position on the staff? Plus, Twitter Tuesday, and Tennessee looks to rebound against Missouri tonight in Como. All that and more here on a Tuesday. Locked on balls. <laughs> Locked on Balls, your daily podcast on the Tennessee Volunteers. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, everybody, and welcome into a Tuesday edition of Locked On Balls, available wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks so much for making it your first listen online and on YouTube. Just search Locked On Balls. Please subscribe to that channel. Tremendous growth over the last week on the YouTube channel. Can't thank you enough for that. I'm your host, Eric Kane, at underscore Kaner on Twitter, and at Locked On Balls is where you can find this podcast. And I do radio at 99.1, the Sports Animal in Knoxville. That's the flagship station for the Vols. And I write for the rival site covering Tennessee at VolQuest.com in case you're new to the show. Like I said in the open, we got a ton, a ton of content to get into today. So we're going to go ahead and get into it. We'll start with Cody Burns. I mean, really, it was kind of a shock that we we made it this long into the offseason. The head coaching cycles have already come and gone. Uh, the carousel's come and gone pretty much for the majority. Now, there's always exceptions. But for the majority, if you were going to go and leave and take another job, it would have already happened by now, right? Well, it just goes to show you that it's never too late. There are always positions that become available as uh, coaches at the next level begin to build their staffs. And that is also what happened here with Cody Burns. Cody Burns, Tennessee's wide receiver coach, is leaving the University of Tennessee to take the same position with the New Orleans Saints. Uh, Burns released a statement on Monday via his Twitter account uh, thanking Vol Nation, essentially, and I'll go ahead and I will read that to you uh, right here. This is from Cody Burns. I am grateful to Coach Heupel, our players, and all of Vol Nation for the incredible experience this past year at Tennessee. We established a strong foundation, set school offensive records, and built relationships that will last a lifetime. As I embark on a dream of coaching in the NFL, I can't wait to see the continued growth of this program under Coach Heupel. Tennessee football is in great hands, and the program's best days are ahead. Thank you so much, Vol Nation, signed Cody Burns. Listen, grand scheme of things, this is not the end of the world. Am I going to say that this is no loss? No, I'm not going to say that. I know Cody Burns, in a lot of people's eyes, a lot of fans' eyes, and a lot of people that do this for a living like me, in, in my type of people's eyes, you know, Cody Burns maybe got a bad rap. I, I don't necessarily get that. Sure, I played football my entire life. Uncle Rico, I played at the next level, albeit it was not in the SEC, wasn't anywhere close. I, but I don't know the wide receiver position. I don't know the passing tree. I don't know what you look for in a good wide receiver. So I'm not going to sit here and evaluate his coaching style and say, well, he did this right or he didn't do this right. I'm going to be honest with you. I, I, I don't know what I'm looking for in that regard. Remember all those overthrows at the beginning of the season with Joe Milton and with with Hendon Hooker a little bit? It wasn't all all on the quarterbacks. It was some was on the wide receivers. When you're looking back for the ball too early, when you're you know not breaking down to to make a cut too early, um, all that type of stuff. The, the littlest things in terms of you know down the field passing makes the biggest difference. And of course, unfortunately, Tennessee fans we saw that a lot um, in the uh, the beginning of the season. But I mean, stats don't lie, right? I mean, look at this, Cedric Tillman. Who in the world was he before this year? I can tell you he was a guy that had eight receptions. Eight receptions in three years until his redshirt junior year, and here he is right now. He had 64 receptions in 13 games at 1,081 yards, 12 touchdowns. He averaged 16.8 yards per carry or per reception, averaged 83 yards a game. Cedric Tillman, though he wasn't named All-SEC, he was an All-SEC caliber wide receiver in 2021 that was not the case before this past season who was Bayless Jones well Bayless was the return man from Southern Cal of course that came over and wanted a fresh start with Tennessee and Jeremy Pruitt in the year of 2020 played a little wide receiver return kicks of course but you know had a couple of touchdowns that there in the last couple of games but really didn't factor in a whole lot on the offensive end that changed in 2021 62 receptions 807 yards averaged 13 yards a pop seven touchdowns 62 yards a game Okay, again, Cedric Tillman, Bayless Jones, two guys that were non-factors essentially on offense in 2020 were the two best wide receivers for the Volunteers in 2021. Who was Javante Payton? Well, he was a guy that kind of went all over the place during his college career, started in junior college, spent a couple of seasons at Mississippi State, didn't do a whole lot at Mississippi State, 
came over at Tennessee, though he didn't have many receptions in 13 games, 18 receptions. That can't be right. He missed a game towards the end of the season because of injury. Nonetheless, 18 receptions, 413 yards, six touchdowns. The definition of a deep threat was Javante Payton, okay? Jalen Hyatt. We had such high expectations for Jalen Hyde coming into the season. Those were not met. But midway through the season, when, we, when they finally figured out that rotation of your three best, Cedric Tillman, Bayless Jones, and Javante Payton, it was Jalen Hyatt that was that fourth receiver, and he played that role very, very well. And I thought it got better and better as the season went along. So stats don't lie, right? But I know what you're thinking. You're sitting here saying, well, it's a product of the system, product of the system. And I think that can be true as well. I think that there is something to that. So I'm not going to dismiss that. You know, wide receivers in a Josh Heupel system tend to flourish if you are in shape and you can get get separation because there's going to be opportunities aplenty down the field. So I do think there's something to that. But also, I'm not just going to sit here and ignore the fact that the position coach with these guys this past season went from a tremendously underproductive group, credit, it was the offense as well with Jim Chaney under Jeremy Pruitt, to what it was this past season under Josh Heupel and Cody Burns, the guy that instructed them every single day in practice. So I think it can be a little bit of both. Um, a lot of people are saying that this is not a big loss. I do not believe this is a devastating loss whatsoever. I really don't. Uh, but I'm not going to just sit here and say, oh, he sucks. It's, it's no big issue at all, because I don't think that he sucked. I thought that he was um, thought that he was you know, decently good at his job. To be so young, he's kind of a veteran in the SEC. He coached, I believe, seven seasons in the SEC, a former quarterback and wide receiver at Auburn, won a national championship. Uh, spent time in that Auburn staff for a couple of seasons and then came over, was hired at UCF before Josh Heibel left UCF, came up to Tennessee, and then ultimately brought him up here to Tennessee as well, but fulfilling his dream and going and coaching in the NFL. So what now? Who's coming? A couple of factors here. It's, you know, at the time of this recording, it's Monday evening at about seven o'clock. Okay. There's not been a whole lot of names being mentioned, but remember, this news broke in the late morning on Monday. So, Hasn't been a whole lot of time right now for a wide receiver hot board. You know that you are a diehard Tennessee fan, that you tune into a, a, a daily Tennessee podcast if you are sitting here waiting for a hot board for a wide receiver coach, and I love it. Keep coming back. <laughs> um, but there's just not one out there yet. A couple of names I have seen thrown around a little bit and with conversations with people on Monday, these are not candidates. These are just names that have been thrown around a little bit. Don't put a lot of stock into these names. I'm telling you right now, don't put a lot of stock into these names. I'm not saying these are candidates, just some names that I've heard and read throughout the day. All right. Um, I'll start with uh, what awesome prize. He dropped a little nugget at ballquest.com on, on, uh, on Monday. And again, his words as well, just like I said, just a name he's heard. Doesn't mean anything. Just a name that he's heard thrown around there a little bit is Mike uh, Bellamy. He's the current running backs coach at Illinois. Uh, he played wide receiver for a couple seasons in the NFL back in the 90s. Uh, he could potentially be a candidate, has a tie with goalish coaching at Illinois as well. Um, fans want Trooper Taylor to come back. I don't see that happening. He is the assistant head coach at Duke with the new staff, so I don't see that happening. Um, one of my buddies that listens to this podcast uh, sent me this name that I found that I thought was intriguing, and I know I'm going to butcher it, so let me let me pull up my notes here. Nate Shelhassi. We'll go with that, right? Nate Shalhassi. He is currently at Iowa State. Um, he coached with Golish for a year at Illinois and for a year at Iowa State. So there's that connection as well. Um, he's the current running backs coach, run game coordinator, and wide receivers coach at um, at Iowa State right now. It looks like so maybe he could, you know, be a guy that that could figure into this thing when it's all said and done. Uh, Billy Gonzalez. Don't believe he's leaving Florida. Anthony Tucker, who has a Golish tie as well, or has a UCF tie. Excuse me. Uh, he's the Offensive coordinator at Utah State. I don't see him leaving there at all because he will not get the offensive coordinator title here. Um, but those are just a couple of names that have been thrown around a little bit. That doesn't mean anything. But a couple of these names that you're seeing here, they have ties to the coaching staff. So I would envision whoever comes in and replaces Cody Burns will have a tie of some sort to Josh Heupel, to Alex Golish, to you know somebody on this staff, right? Because again, coaching is a fraternity. If you coach with somebody before, you cross paths with somebody before, you, you remember that guy. If they made an impression on you, you might try to bring him back. Um, also, Cody Burns, according to a new Sentinel report back in March of last year, uh, Burns was set to make four hundred twenty-five thousand dollars this past season with a retention bonus if he was through if he was on the staff through the end of the twenty twenty-two season. So, um, not a whole lot of money, um, but not the lowest paid coach on staff. Uh, so you're looking at a guy that will want to come in here and work for that, if not just a little bit more potentially. So 
very early in this process. We'll be tracking it right here at Lockdown Vols. And of course, you can follow me at underscore Kaner and follow the work of, of the team over at VolQuest that I'm fortunate to be a part of. Uh, when there is a name that is emerging, you will know about it uh, there and here. I can promise you that. But Cody Burns is off to the NFL. Um, Again, I don't think this is a devastating blow to Tennessee, but I'm not going to ignore it. I mean, you know, Cedric Tillman, career year. Bayless Jones, a career year who has turned into a draftable football player that is soaring up boards right now. Cedric Tillman is now a draftable football player. Javante Payton went from nothing to a guy that was a deep threat and scored six touchdowns in SEC play. Um, this is not nothing. Now, you can also look. I've seen some chatter a little bit today as well saying, oh, with Jimmy Calloway, Jimmy Holiday, Jalen Hyatt, they didn't, uh, you know, they, they, they didn't um, develop any. Well, Sure, they didn't play much. You're right. But there were not a lot of snaps to be had at wide receiver. And though they did not take advantage of those early snaps that they got um, earlier this season. So I hear you there. But stats don't lie. Top three receivers did really, really well this year. And I do think that you can thank Cody Burns for a lot of that. So we will be tracking who the next wide receiver coach is here at Locked On Balls. Can't wait to figure out who it is. And, uh, of course, we will break it all down when a hire is made. Tell you everything you need to know about that next individual. Twitter Tuesday coming up next here on Locked on Vols. And, you know, we're talking about football right now, but sadly, football season, it's over. But basketball season is in full swing. Both college, and we'll have a we'll have a preview of Tennessee heading to Missouri later in the show, um, and in pro. All right, Team LeBron, Team Durant the other night in the NBA All-Star game. What a joke. But, hey, the NBA, it's in full swing, too. Uh, for the latest odds, totals, player props, to where the next coach is fired, wherever he might land, betonline.net is your number one spot for all your sports betting needs. Okay, Bet Online remains the best spot for all your sports scores, podcasts, and news this season. And it's not just basketball. BetOnline.net your source for hockey, for boxing, for, UC, for UFC. See, I said UCF in that prior segment. Now I'll get UFC and UCF mixed up. All that and more here on this season, plus Olympic coverage is just wrapped up from Beijing. Head on over to the website today or sign up on your mobile device to see all the trends and the latest action. Bet online. It is where the game starts. Welcome back into a Tuesday edition of Locked On Vols. I'm Eric Kane. Thanks for hanging out with me here today. We talked Cody Burns in segment one, and we're about to get into Twitter Tuesday. Uh, but before we do get into that, one thing I failed to mention in segment one, I do not believe this will be an internal hire, meaning I don't believe Hypo will promote somebody that's currently in an analyst role or an off-the-field role, that could always change. But I don't believe that will be the case. I mean, I don't think there's a Joe Osevet sitting um, in an analyst role right now that's ready to step in, if that makes sense. So um, I don't expect that to happen again. That can always change. Also, there could be some flexibility here. So you saw it with um, with Chris Winkie, with Jeremy Pruitt's staff. He came in, he coached running backs the first year, and then coached quarterbacks the last two years, right? You know, Jerry Mack has coached pretty much every position on the offensive side, but he's coached wide receivers a lot longer than he's coached running backs. In fact, he's coached running backs is the first time he's ever coached that position this past season in 2021. So potentially, if you find a running backs coach that can come in, maybe Jerry Mack could slide and go back to coaching wide receivers. So there could be some flexibility in there. I wanted to mention that as an option uh, for Tennessee as it continues to look for a replacement for Cody Burns, who was off to the National Football League, taking the same job with the New Orleans Saints. All right, let's get into it. Uh, let's get into some Twitter Tuesday. A couple late submissions, and when I mean late submissions, I'm talking like I am recording this podcast and I'm getting them into my DMs right now. So appreciate you guys for getting them in here for me today. And uh, Jason, we'll start with you, the latest one. Um, how will losing Cody Burns affect recruiting? I'm not as concerned about the on-the-field coaching. I trust Heupel to make a good hire. Any recruits that were close to Burns or that he was the primary recruiter uh, that you could choose uh, to now look elsewhere? Well, pretty much any wide receiver that Tennessee's on, Cody Burns is heavily involved, right? Like Carnell Tate, product of IMG Academy, one of the top wide receivers in this class. I mean, Josh Heupel is obviously involved there, but so was Cody Burns. Um, you know, Devin Hyatt's, Jalen Hyatt's little brother, Cody Burns is involved there. Marquez uh, Taylor, who is one of the better athletes from the state of Tennessee, the Tennessee likes an awful lot. You know, Cody Burns is involved there. Um, so pretty much any wide receiver prospect uh, that is looking at Tennessee, obviously Burns would be involved there. But again, you can overcome all that with your, if your head coach has a good relationship with that prospect if your offensive coordinator, Alex Golich, has a good relationship with that prospect. I'm not saying Cody Burns was a bad recruiter, but you know, I, I don't think this staff is filled with exceptional recruiters. I just I don't believe that. Ronnie Gardner is a good recruiter. 
Um, I think Willie Martinez has done a lot of good work. I think Tim Banks has done some good work so far uh, while his time is he while he's been here. But I wouldn't say in 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 LRB as well. But I wouldn't say the staff is filled with quote unquote recruiters. Uh, like it was uh, with the Jeremy Pruitt staff, and I know you're making jokes right now as well. So I wouldn't say it affects it largely, but it is worth noting because, again, every wide receiver Tennessee's after right now, of course, the names I mentioned, just a few of the names I mentioned right there, um, you know, Burns is heavily involved. So, Jason, I appreciate your question. Uh, we will go to Jacob. Love the podcast. Love your work. Jacob, I love your comment. Thanks so much. Any idea of the front runner of who the wide receiver coach will be? Who would you want it to be? Thank you for taking my question. Yeah, I, you know, I, I read off some names right there that have been tossed around. I don't think any of those guys are serious, serious candidates. I think it's pretty early right now. So I have no clue who I believe the front runner is or who really is going to be involved in this. Um, we'll know more as the week goes on for sure. As far as who I want, I don't really care. I don't have a preference. Um, I, I think a lot of this is system-based like we talked about. Um, that doesn't mean that you don't need a guy that's capable of coaching these guys that has been there, that has done that, can teach the braids, can teach the hand fighting, all that type of stuff, can teach how to get behind receivers and bend back um, on those coverages. You need somebody like that. So I would like a veteran coach, a coach that's been around a long time, a coach that's been there, done that, preferably a coach that's played the position before and uh, a coach that has connections to this coaching staff, albeit really hypo with this offensive scheme, that would be uh, a plus for me. So we'll see how it plays out. I don't really have a front runner, but someone that kind of um, has all of those qualities. Uh, we will move on and we will go to, let's see, Ben. Ben chimes in. He got at us over the weekend a couple of days ago. So Ben, I appreciate you uh, getting involved. Eric, after that Tennessee whooping for Kentucky the other night, actually this is last week, how great has that rivalry been in recent years? Quick answer, it's been fantastic. Uh, do you think that it's a top five rivalry in college basketball currently? Quick answer, probably not. Um, I think it's an underrated rivalry. I would agree with that. Both fan bases genuinely despise one another, 100%. Thanks for giving us of all fans a great podcast. Hey, thank you for listening. Um, quick answer, I wouldn't say it's top five. There are just so many historic basketball rivalries. It's hard to say Tennessee-Kentucky would be in there, to be honest with you. But it 100% is an underrated rivalry. It's one of the best rivalries in the SEC for sure. The barnes Calipari tenures going back and forth, those battles have been fantastic. So 100% it is there. But, I mean, is it going to supplant Duke Carolina? No. You know, Kentucky-Louisville, you know, uh, Kansas-Kansas State, UCLA-Arizona, you know, Georgetown-Villanova, Indiana-Purdue, um, Syracuse-Georgetown, Michigan-Ohio State, you know, one that dates back Duke-Maryland. Michigan, Michigan states. I mean, Kentucky's got a rivalry with a bunch of other teams so far. I've, you know, I've, you know, you can think of Kentucky, uh, Kentucky, Louisville, Kentucky, Indiana, Kentucky, Florida, a little bit as well. Um, you know, a couple more. I'm just trying to think of Marquette, Wisconsin. I'm running through a list right here to see if I miss any that just you know jump out. I mean, Stanford, Cal, um, yada yada. I mean, those are you know those are the big ones that I've that I've mentioned right there. So. Are, is is that going to supplant any of those top five that I read on early on? Maybe not, but I mean, I, I say it's up there for sure. And, uh, you know, as this rivalry continues on, these games are always competitive. And if they're not competitive, it's a blowout one way or the other. But that doesn't mean the other teams are not going to get the better of them the next go around. We've seen that in this series as well. So a uh, good question there, uh, Ben. I think it is fantastic rivalry. I think it's severely underrated. And uh, it's been a whole lot of fun to watch. Uh, we will go to... Josh, Josh chimes in with the impressive attendance for Vol Baseball this past weekend. What do you think the optimum capacity should be for Lindsey Nelson Stadium? Um, so I, I don't have the exact number on me because, again, they put new bleachers in there. So that's, that's up the attendance a little bit. I would assume that it's around 5,000 somewhere, maybe a little over. Um, and, and it's been like this last weekend was awesome. By the way, I'm going to be covering the game on Tuesday uh, today and on Saturday as well. So looking forward to that. If you want baseball coverage updates, you know, give me a follow at underscore Kaner and at uh, uh, rivals, uh, VolQuestRivals.com. Um, it, it should be a lot more. Don't get me wrong, but I mean, you know, you've already been, you, you, the venue's already there, right? So you can only add so many bleachers, which they've done uh, down the left field line. They built the porch, the, you know, and that, that adds a lot as well. Hopefully they'll get some more premium seating in there as more renovations come to Neyland Stadium. It needs to, it needs to increase by, you know, two, three, four, five thousand for sure, because, you look at the attendance around the SEC, Florida, 
no contest. Ole Miss, no contest. You know, Mississippi State, no contest. I mean, we're talking 20s, a uh, 25,000 in terms of capacity of those stadiums that look like a minor league stadium, if we're being completely honest. So you can only do so much with Lindsey Nelson Stadium without tearing it down and starting over, which I do not believe that's the plan. I think, you know, there's going to be some renovations specifically, you know, beyond the right field wall of a training facility with some dorms on top or condos or something of the nature, potentially. Um, you know, we'll, we'll have to see. So, um, it it's the attendance has been fantastic. The environment there is so much better than what it has been. It's been awesome, but I realistically, in terms of attendance, you're never going to compete with some of those other ones in the SEC simply because logistically, uh, you just can't. But a uh, great question there, and keep up the attendance at Lindsey Nelson. It has been fun. All right, we'll get to we will get to one more. Devin wants to know, and Devin is a viewer on YouTube. Thanks so much for checking out uh, the show on YouTube. If you haven't subscribed, please subscribe on YouTube. Search Locked On Balls. <laughs> Why is there, excuse me, I don't know why I said they're so uh, so weird. Why is there so much Duke stuff? I'm trying to read my own writing. Why is there so much Duke stuff in your background? Well, if you're watching on YouTube right now, you see my kick A setup. All right, I've got tons of bobbleheads. I've got pictures, um, and I've got some uh, I've got some Duke paraphernalia here. Um, I'll take my lower third down real quick, and you can see a, du- a little a little Duke like little line over there, a Duke basketball picture, a Duke picture frame. You see a Coach K bobblehead. Um, so yeah, that's the and a, a Duke book that's laying on the on the desk right there. If you're if you're watching on YouTube, um, my grandfather was a Duke graduate and uh, he raised our entire family to be Duke fans. So I know a lot of you guys are cringing. I know a lot of you guys hate me now, but that is what it is. I spent my childhood uh, going to some highly competitive non-conference, not ACC games for the most part, but non-conference uh, basketball games at Cameron and Door. Um, I've been to ACC tournament games. I saw t- I saw uh, Duke win a I saw Tennessee. I saw Duke win an ACC tournament back in 2010 against Georgia Tech. That was the year they went on and won a national championship. Um, I've seen Duke play in some big time games. So it's because of my grandfather. Um, he raised our family as Duke fans. Obviously, grew up in East Tennessee. Went to Tennessee football games, Tennessee basketball games. Now I live in Knoxville and cover the ball. So obviously, you know, Tennessee is a big part of my life too. But um, you know, just kind of kind of born into it type situation. So. Uh, my grandfather, may he rest in peace, uh, My gave me my love of sports. As you can see, I've got tons and tons of baseball paraphernalia and bobbleheads and pictures, the Atlanta Braves. I got that from him as well. Um, so that would answer that question. And hopefully I haven't ran anybody out of here. Um, I don't watch Duke much anymore. I mean, I watch college basketball. Don't get me wrong, but I cover Tennessee. So when you cover a team, your life is pretty much over outside of that team, right? So I don't watch much of Duke anymore, but um. Uh, that would be uh, the answer to that. So, all right, Devin, appreciate that. And appreciate all you guys for chiming in for a little Twitter Tuesday action every single week. Twitter Tuesday, it's when you take over the show. We'll come back, get you set for Tennessee on the road in Como, looking to take down Missouri and rebound after that loss to Arkansas this past weekend. So looking forward to that. After I tell you about Rock Auto, with the ever-increasing numbers of makes and models, it's now impossible for your local chain of auto parts store to stock all the parts that you might need. So, why endure the off, often pointless or seemingly intimidating questioning uh, and wait while the person behind the counter orders the parts from their computer, choosing only the brands and uh, specifications that w- their warehouse happens to carry? You have computers and you have access to rockauto.com at your home and in your pockets, okay? Save time and money when using Rock Auto. Don't spend up to 30 to 50, sometimes even 100% more for the same parts that you can buy from uh, on rockauto.com. It's a family business serving it to do it your, do it yourself for over 20 years. The prices are always so reliably low and competitive. You're not going to beat the prices that you find at rockauto.com. Go explore their easy to use website. You hear my voice crack? They're easy to use websites and discover for yourself right now. You can find everything at rockauto.com. Go there right now. Check it out. uh, See all the parts available for your car and your truck. Right locked on in the how did you hear about us box so they know that we sent you. Amazing selection. Reliably low prices. All the parts your car will ever need. Visit my friends at rockauto.com. All right, guys. We got a final segment left here on a Tuesday Locked On Balls. We'll have Josh Ward Wednesday coming up tomorrow. And, of course, a complete recap of Tennessee at Missouri as the Vols look to rebound following that loss again uh, to Arkansas over the weekend. So uh, on that note, let's go ahead and preview that matchup as we welcome you back in here to Locked On Vols. I'm Eric Kane. Tennessee, in short, Tennessee should whip Missouri's tail. 
Simply put, Tennessee is the better team. Tennessee, top to bottom, has had a better year. It's statistically, it's not even a contest. And the Ken Palm rankings, it's not even a contest. But it's why you play the game. You don't play it on paper. You play it out there on the hardwood, right? Tennessee, 19-7, and seven, fell back one spot in the latest AP poll to number 17, 10-4 and four in SEC play. Missouri, 10-17, and 4-10 and 10 in SEC play. You have the uh, Tigers. This will be the first time these two teams have met uh, this season, but let's not forget uh, that whooping that uh, Missouri put on Tennessee last time these two teams met. It was January 23rd of last season. 27 points from Xavier Pinson, um, and Tennessee turned the basketball over just a ton. Missouri had 10 steals and forced 18 Tennessee turnovers. Epons actually led the way with 20 points. Uh, Victor Bailey Jr. had 12 points. Josiah Jordan James had 12 points. Uh, Missouri, but pretty much had control over that ball game for uh, the majority uh, the majority of it. Had a 12-3 run uh, to cut uh, the Missouri lead to 28-25, heading into the last two minutes of the first half, did Tennessee. But from there, it was Missouri that came out of the gates and put that game away. So nonetheless, that was the, what happened last time Tennessee and Missouri uh, met up on the hardwood. But this go-around, Missouri lost three straight games, okay? Uh, lost to Arkansas, which, of course, Tennessee just did that. That was last week in the midweek. Had two games, unique situation. Missouri is about to play its third game in five days, okay? Why? Played Mississippi State on Friday, lost at Mississippi State, came back to Como, played Mississippi State on Sunday, lost in a close one, all right? So why did they do that? Well, there was a January 5th matchup that was postponed, I would assume, due to COVID reasons. So it was a makeup game on Friday. So third game in last in, in a five-day span, Tennessee now welcomes, or uh, Missouri now welcomes Tennessee to Mizzou Arena. But it lost three straight. Missouri um, has won only one of its last five games. Missouri 7-7 seven and seven at home at Mizzou Arena, 2-5 and five in the SEC. Uh, Missouri is four is four and 15. Let me say that again. Missouri is four and 15 combined in quad one and two games this season. Uh, quad one wins home against Alabama, a neutral site victory over SMU and an away victory over Texas A&M, but who hadn't beat A&M this year, right? Uh, junior Kobe Brown forward is the guy you got to watch out for team leading 12.4 points per game, a team leading 7.9 rebounds per game. That mark is six best in the sec and a 1.3 steals per game. So it kind of does a little bit of everything. That is Kobe Brown. Senior guard Javon Pickett, he scored in double figures in his last 11 SEC games. In SEC play this year, he's scoring 12.4 points per game and shooting at a 48.4% clip. That is fifth best in league play. So the two guys you got to watch out for is Kobe Brown and Javon Pickett as uh, Missouri looks to snap a three-game skid and prove to eight and seven at home inside Missouri arena. But like I said, it's no contest right now in terms of what you look for in the Ken Palm rankings. Tennessee is 12th. Missouri is 140th. Uh, Tennessee is 11th in the net. I didn't even look up what Missouri is because it doesn't matter, but Tennessee is 11th in the net and Ken Palm's adjusted defensive efficiency ratings. Tennessee is fourth. Missouri is 133rd uh, in the offensive efficiency ratings. Tennessee is 39th, slipped back from 33rd to 39th after that just disgusting game against Arkansas over the weekend. Tennessee is 39th. Missouri is 165th. Ken Palm's strength of schedule, Tennessee is 4th. Missouri is 6th. So obviously both of those two teams playing extremely tough uh, schedules this year. Uh, but obviously the ESPN um, a Basketball Power Index loves the balls in this one, obviously. Uh, no surprise there, 92.6% chance of victory. You have Missouri that scores 65 points per game. It allows 70.1 points per game. Tennessee scores 73 points a game, allows 62 points per game. Field goal percentage, Missouri shooting at 42%, Tennessee at 43%. Rebounds per game, Tennessee is getting 36, Missouri is getting 34. Assists per game, remember Tennessee had a season low five assists in that loss against Arkansas over the weekend. Uh, Tennessee averages 16.4 assists per game, Mizzou 11.9. No wonder the offense is struggling so much. Uh, Tennessee, both both Tennessee and Missouri averaging four blocks per game. Uh, Tennessee averages nine, a little over nine steals a game, while Missouri does six. And of course, Tennessee has lost one in a row. Its last outing snapped an eight game losing, snapped an eight game winning streak in the SEC at Arkansas over the weekend. And Missouri and Conzo Martin have lost three straight. So usually. When you play Missouri, usually when, we, when you play a, a Martin team, it's disgusting. It's a defensive battle team, but even this team's not playing good defense this year, right? 
Hopefully, Tennessee will break out of its offensive woes that uh, uh, derailed it um, at Arkansas on Saturday, and Tennessee can back, get back into the win column and try to finish off this six-game stretch on a high note. All right. That is going to do it for this edition of Locked On Vols. We taught Cody Burns' departure. We took your questions for Twitter Tuesday, and we previewed up Tennessee at Missouri tonight. We'll have a complete recap of that one coming up tomorrow. And, of course, we will catch up with Josh Ward and give you the latest on the replacement for uh, Cody Burns. Thanks so much for making Locked On Vols your first listen each and every day. And watching it on YouTube. Can't thank you enough. And uh, now your second listen needs to be Locked on the NFL Draft. Ryan Tracy and former NFL cornerback Eric Crocker bring the NFL Draft to life every day with insight and analysis on college football prospects and NFL front offices. It's free and available wherever you get your podcast. Again, your second listen, it should be Locked on NFL Draft. That is going to do it here for a Tuesday Locked on Balls. Again, I'm Eric Kane. Thank you so much for hanging out with me today. Can't thank you enough, and let's do it again tomorrow, everybody. Until then, enjoy the rest of your Tuesday and uh, hopefully watching some better Tennessee basketball tonight.